Today's scripture reading comes from Genesis 17, 9 through 27. James, this is a big one. Then God said to Abraham, as for you, you must keep my covenant and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you. The covenant you are to keep, every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and you. For the generations to come, every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised, including those born in your household or brought with money with it from a foreigner, those who are not your offspring. Whether born in your household or brought bought with your money, they must be circumcised. My covenant in your flesh is to be an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who has not been circumcised in the flesh will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. God also said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of people will come from her. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of people will come from her. I will bless her and she will surely be uh, give you a son by her. Then God said, yes, but your wife will, like Sarah, will bear you a son and you will call him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him and, uh, and for Ishmael, I have heard you. I will surely bless him. I will make him fruitful and will greatly increase his number. He will be the father of 12 rulers and I will make him into a great nation. For my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you, will be this next year. When he had finished speaking with Abraham, God went up from him. And on the very day Abraham took his son Ishmael and all these born in his household or bought with his money, every male in his household and uncircumcised them and circumcised them as God told him. Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised and his son Ishmael was 13. Abraham and his son Ishmael were both circumcised on that very day. And every male in Abraham's household, including those born in his household or bought uh, from a foreigner, was circumcised with him. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. It's probably the only time you will hear the word circumcised 500 times in a, <laughs> in a scripture reading. You may be seated. It... Um, it is a passage that sometimes gets skipped over because there's so, there's so much there that it's hard to fathom in our current context. It's hard to think about in our current context. And I want to say thank you first to Alan for filling in for me last week. We did have a very good trip to Guatemala and we saw how God worked. And I probably will... Um, process a little more, but the one thing that I saw that I felt that I understood more than anything was how faithful God is when we choose to obey. So this morning we finish our Felt Board Faith series. We come, we haven't come to the end of Abraham's story. That will happen sometime later. Um, but we have reached a point in which we can set it on the shelf till next summer. So this week, we look at the fact that Abraham is now Abraham, and he will continue to live into the covenant. It is now the sign of the covenant, a visible way of recognizing what God had promised. In our passage today, there is a lot of talk about how we are right in the middle of this naming thing. You, Alan talked last week about how Abraham would become Abraham, Abram would become Abraham, and Sarai would become Sarah. 
and the value of that identity. In the part in which we are in today, we really sit with the issue that Abraham struggled to understand why God couldn't use what was already there. I want you to hear the words from verses 18 through 22 once again. And Abraham said to God, If only Ishmael could live under your blessing. And then God said to him, Yes, but your wife Sarah will bear you a son, and you will call him Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him, an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. This is where God reminds, actually this is the first time we actually hear that Sarah is the one through whom the covenant comes. Every, I, I fully think that for many, in many ways, while Abraham and, Abram and Sarah, Sarah said, well, we want this covenant to happen, so we'll help God, if you remember of the past few weeks. And so Hagar can be the way in which the covenant becomes a reality. But today, we hear the words, no, your heir will come through Sarah. Sarah is a part of the covenant blessing of God. It's also where we hear that in this passage, God says, I will bless Ishmael, but my covenant will be with Isaac. Now, I want you to understand that Ishmael and Isaac represent two different births. Ishmael is the product of human will to live out what we think God wants. Isaac, born in the middle of, midst of a miracle, is the son of promise. We see in, in, in these two young men that Ishmael represents for us our fleshly birth. It is for us what we know and, so, and spiritually represents the ways in which we may attempt to um, accomplish what we think God wants. And Isaac is the one in which we can say that represents God doing what only God can do. Ishmael's birth represents our birth in the flesh. Isaac only happens by the hand of God. Abraham himself, as God tells him, he laughs. In verse, verse 20, I don't know where to go. In verse 17, he says, Abram fell face down. He laughed and said to himself, Will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? And then he turns his question to God. If only Ishmael could live under your blessing. So God, I already have this. Why can't you just use him? Because this seems to be an impossibility. And I promise you this, when we walk by faith, that is when we recognize what God does because it's only what God can do, because it's not our own doing. There, as we were in Guatemala, our very first day, we had the opportunity to hear the story of the man who, his name is Mike Clark. He and his wife, Dottie, um, founded this children's home, Casa Alleluia, in 1989. But... Five years prior to that, he had been on a mission trip with a group of people in Guatemala, and um, one night he couldn't sleep. And he said he got up and decided to go for a walk. And as he walked around, it was a cold, dreary night. It was very dark. But he could see as he was walking through the area that there appeared to be um, these clumps 
and he, at first he said he thought it was just trash. But as he approached the area, he saw that these clumps were actually, actually groups of children huddling together, trying to stay warm. He said the homeless population of children in Guatemala is astounding. And so all of the ways in which um, he said, well, God, why don't you do something? And God said, I will. He said that that never left him. That God continued to stir in that, God, why don't you do something? And he said that one night in prayer, he realized that God was sending him to do something. And he said, well, God, if you're going to do that, if you really want me to do that, then you're going to have to provide land and a place. And there's, gonna, there's all kinds of things are going to have to happen before we can do that. He was a pastor in southern Louisiana. Those things began to fall into place. One by one, the things that he couldn't do himself, God did. To begin to allow this place to be a place where children of neglect and abuse and abandonment would come to not only find a place of safety and security but also meet Jesus. Every week, they ha every Sunday, probably about now, they're gathering together for worship. And you, it, Brooklyn made the comment um, to me on the Wednesday evening that we went to their worship service, and she said, this is kind of like church camp with everybody the same age as you are all year long. It is an opportunity to see the joy in the children as they sing the songs of praise. It is the result of God doing what only God can do. But how many of us spend our time, like Abraham, focused on what we can do for God rather than what God can do through us? Sometimes God wants to show up in our lives in ways that we won't allow him to because it's not what we did. We are called to step out in faith. Sometimes that means doing something that we think is absolutely absurd. How can I have a child at the age of 100 in order for God to work, we have to say yes. Okay. I will step out in faith, not knowing just exactly what you're going to do, but I'm willing to be the vessel by which you do it. So Abraham recognizes that God himself is the one who could do it. There are too many times when we choose to cling to our past or cling to what we know rather than step out in faith. I know it's not easy because there are times I find that I want God to show up in my time, in, my, in the ways that I think are good and important. But I must confess, those are times when I'm not walking by faith. Because too often my focus is on the things that I can see and the things that I can touch or experience or accomplish for myself. But one commentator put the idea of Ishmael and Isaac representing ourselves this way. Ishmael symbolizes man's fleshly way of accomplishing something for God. But Isaac, the miracle baby, was born by the power of God. Ishmael brought dissension into the home. Isaac brought laughter. And then in the New Testament, we hear in John 3, where um, Jesus says that the, what is born of the flesh is flesh. And then in Romans 7, 18, Paul says, For I know in my flesh dwells no good thing. Our human nature, our desire to accomplish, to do what is good and right, can only go so far. 
but it is when we walk by faith that God can work the miracle in us and through us into the lives of others. Now this whole passage seemed to be centered around this thing called circumcision, which we believe that circumcision was an outward sign of an inward grace, which is the same thing we believe about baptism. We believe that when families come to be baptized or individuals or we bring infants to be baptized, it is an acknowledgement that God is the one doing something that will draw them to him, not anything we can do on our own. You see, all of them were circumcised as a way of identifying that they were the people of God. We use baptism as a way of signifying and identifying us as a part of the kingdom of God, the family that God has brought together. Something God does, not anything that we do. It is about God's plan. And so in the final verses of this chapter, we see that Abraham yielded to God's plan. Obedience requires God has a plan for each and every one of us, but when we cling to what we have or what we know, we may miss out on the wonderful, bright, and glorious thing that God has for us. But what does Abraham do? Abraham and all his household receive the sign of the covenant. So when you and I, who have been baptized, choose to live out our baptismal vows, we began the journey of stepping into faith and saying, yes, I choose to follow the God who will do in me what only God can do. So there are so many ways in which God may be working in you. And re- I want, I said it before, If you're still breathing, God still has a purpose for you. You're not dead yet, so don't say it's somebody else's job. Because God has a purpose from beginning to end. The question is, will we put aside our Ishmael and receive our Isaac? Let us pray. Most holy and gracious God, You have challenged us today. Challenged us to walk in faith and be faithful. To do as Abraham did and trust and obey. We see in Abraham's life an entire life of obedience, even in the midst of failure. So today, Lord, we ask that you would help us to come to remember our baptism, and to trust and obey. I pray in the mighty name of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that our lives may bring honor and glory to God. Amen.